I'm Lockie. And I'm Oliver. And, and this, this is, is The Open, Open Source, Source Show. Show. I'm Lockie, a PM at Azure. And I'm Oliver Gould, the creator of Linkerd. Oliver, in a previous episode, we learned all about Rust. Let's actually learn how Rust is being used in the real world. Can you tell me how you made the decision to write Linkerd2 in Rust? Yeah, so when we actually started working on Linkerd in 2015 or so, uh, we tried to do the first implementation in Rust before it was 1.0, it was still in beta. We got about a week or two into it and it was just too hard. The ecosystem wasn't there, there wasn't a networking stack, there weren't HTTP libraries, we were gonna have to build everything from the ground up. And so we didn't, we stopped and we wrote it all in Scala and a couple years passed and all of a sudden Rust had all the things we wanted to have um, or almost did. So we started to invest very heavily there and built Linkerd2's proxy in Rust and it's been off to the races ever since. And what was it about what you were doing in Linkerd1 that kind of led you to look at, at languages like Rust? In Linkerd1 we'd had a lot of production users at scale and it was good if you could give the JVM enough resources to be healthy. Uh, but when you're running containerized applications with hundreds of instances per host, uh, running a side curve per each container in a JVM world is just infeasible memory-wise. Uh, and then performance-wise, latency-wise, the JVM is a garbage collector which introduces slowness randomly into your system. Uh, with Rust, we have the compiler deal with all of that. So we don't have a garbage collector at runtime. The compiler deals with safety, making sure that we neither have memory leaks, nor do we have to go do a bunch of memory management at runtime. And so when a request is done using memory, the resources just get freed, and we have a much healthier system. But Rust was designed with concurrency and performance and safety in mind from the ground up. We don't want to depend on OpenSSL, so being able to move into an entirely Rust-based system means that we get a much higher degree of trust in the me way memory is used, in very fundamental ways in, in that part of the stack. So describe to me the function of this proxy that you reference. What is it responsible uh, so, for? So Linkerd is a service mesh. What our Linkerd proxy does is it gets deployed with applications and manage many of the reliability, performance, and security concerns. So those applications don't need to take those concerns internally. As you compared what you'd done in Linkerd 1 to Linkerd 2 in Rust, performance-wise, did you notice some uh, change? Once we worked out some of the kinks in terms of tuning socket options, it far exceeded my expectations. In Linkerd 1, we were probably several milliseconds P99 and 100 megs or more of RAM. Two were about two megs of RAM and sub milliseconds. So it's actually substantially, substantially better. Substantially like better. Uh, we looked going to Linkerd2 that we wanted to really kill the resource issue. We wanted to keep all the correctness that we got with Linkerd1 and the type system in Scala, move that into a native environment where we can have no memory overhead of gar or garbage collection or anything like that. What was it about Rust specifically that made you really comfortable with putting it in the data path at an early stage of Linkerd2? We wanted that native performance, right? So it had, the performance couldn't be a sacrifice. Uh, we wanted that correctness, which the type system gives us, but we also wanted the trust of not linking against C libraries. So having a component written in Rust that's responsible for such a critical piece of infrastructure, um, it, it begs the question, is Rust production ready? I think production ready is different for different people. Yes. Uh, we've been willing to make the investment to make it production ready for our needs. It may be harder to scale an engineering org with hundreds of people up on that in a production ready way. But for our kind of small team working on Linkerd, it's been really good. Uh, we, we're actively investing on lots of diagnostic tooling and tracing systems that we're gonna have to build into, into the ecosystem but it's actively becoming a production ready stack. Okay, so is there an ecosystem of crates that you can pull out there from the wild that are solving you know, boilerplate problems yeah, that you otherwise, okay. Yeah. So if you go to crates.io, you can look through a whole catalog of various crates sorted by popularity and so on that deal with uh, crypto without C-linking, for instance, or that deal with caching, or that deal with HDP caching, there are all sorts of different crates out there that uh, make it easy to get up and running. 
However, a lot of the networking stack we've invested in, so things like Tower, which is the Finagle-like service abstraction. On top of that, we've built a gRPC system, so that's HTTP2. We actually had to write an HTTP2 codec in Rust, so in our networking stack, we're not using any C libraries. We're not linking into libv or something else and just running with it. Um, but luckily, it's being used in a lot of places, so it, it's easier to get that testing now. Let's talk about the kind of developer experience around Rust. What is it like for your development team? So, so Rust comes with its own set of build tooling. It comes with Cargo by default, which is the kind of easiest way to get up and running with packages, which they should call crates in Rust. So I, for instance, switch between Go and Rust in VS Code all the time. Other people on the team use other systems. But because it, can, it comes with a Rust language server that does it kind of independent from editors, so you can get really good editor integrations across editors. How do, how do the development team find Rust package management as compared to uh, languages that we're using Scala or, yeah, or so such? Un unlike Scala, Rust's packaging system is source-based, so I'm always downloading sources and compiling them, but I'm not vendoring them into my code in the same way. And in Linkerd, we commit the lock file, cargo.lock, which pins us on dependencies, so all the developers have the same set of sources when they're developing, and we can move safely. And what about um, testing and test frameworks? How, how different is that in Rust? I, it's basically like any other modern language that has testing built in from, from the ground up. Yeah. So Cargo has Cargo test and it just works. You can do things like uh, fuzz testing with Quick Check, which we do a whole bunch of, and we write integration tests that do network tests with Rust. And so it, it's totally viable. How are you tracking something like Linkerd against all the movement in Rust? Is that a challenge at this point in the development? Luckily, the Rust community divides their releases into three uh, channels. We have stable, beta, and nightly. In Linkerd, uh, we pin to stable. We're very conservative in terms of the new features we adopt. When you're starting in Rust, most people pin to Nightly. Nightly sometimes breaks, but that's where all the cool features are. We make investments in playing with the Nightly so that we're not surprised by anything when it comes in. We want the community ecosystem to vet them before we pull them into the project. Okay, so if I have a team, we want to write something in Rust, where do I go to get started? You can go to rustling.org, but my suggestion is to go find a project that's written in Rust where you have a community and some source code to go read and get involved. It's a lot easier to start that way. Okay, thanks for joining us and teaching us more about how you've used Rust to solve problems in Linkerd 2. Thanks. All the links are in the description and you can go to opensource.microsoft.com. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Thanks for joining us on The Open Source Show.